What's going on, Absolute Abundance Family? This is part two of Define Incarceration Roundtable Discussion with Project Rebound and Brown Issues. And this is gonna be part two. This is a panel of three, which was Andrew of Project Rebound Sacramento and Manuel of Brown Issues Sacramento. So let's get right back to it. And we're gonna be continuing this panel and we'll be answering certain questions. And, and don't forget to subscribe, drop a comment, give us a like. Let's get right back to it. To uh, uh, basic defined uh, work. And so I used at, at a community college campus to just kind of like help me find work and just help me just transition out. And I wasn't able to get on immediately and uh, get on campus. It took me about doing pretty well at, at community college and um, you know, I, I took a sociology class and, and by Cal Jason, <laughs> really like oh, you know, but it, it was just a, a quite like I've always been kind of a sociologist in, in a lot of different ways, and but I just like never really questioned things like why is my neighbor Donnie in the cell next to me in DDI? Like those things don't really cross my mind when I was in there. I'm like, oh, that's my homeboy Donnie, right? Oh, 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 he opened the windows uh, uh, and we'll, we'll chop it up. But but I never thought about this. Like why is Donnie me and some other folks from the same? Neighborhood South Sacramento in there, uh, in there, right? And so uh, sociology kind of helped me put that into a, uh, a context that I was able to uh, understand, and I was able to have that transformative, uh, that transformative experience. Um, because um, I ended up uh, transferring to a four-year university, and that actually, you know, even exploring that even further, you know. Um, Doing some of the work uh, with finding other people on campus who are like myself, who was also on the incarcerated, and just you know, birds of feather flock together, and uh, we just begin organizing on campus. You know, rallies on Prop Fifty Seven, um, put a conference together called Beyond the Bars at, 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 at Los Angeles, and so I think a lot of that I was able to like realize like I can do this. Like all these things that I always had to wait for other people to do, I don't have to wait for anybody. You know, I have the ability to take well, take this on. And so when I realized that, realized my own potential, I'm like, if I could do this, everybody else I come in contact with who has these similar experiences can also do it. And so uh, that just got me really motivated. Like. I want other people to be able to experience a, a, a type of freedom that I was able to experience. Because you know, being on parole, you're, you're free, but you're not really free. Getting off parole, you're still stuck with the, the mental health stuff, right? And you're not really free. And so, how do we get past this? This, you know, from being physically incarcerated to being uh, uh, released, like fully released. And I think um, uh, understanding that that education can actually do that. And I think uh, Frederick Douglass really really spoke to that point in particular because he learned how to read when he was still a slave. But his mind was free long before his body was. And so um, I wanted to be able to like expand on that and be able to have other people have that same opportunity I have given because it'd be very selfish of me if I just stuck there and just did the terror about it. Got my degree and went to work, and not really cared about the next man or woman behind me because it's not about me; it's about us. And so that's kind of like my my story on that. Oh man! So that first of why I became a teacher that was difficult. I'm still trying to figure that part out. <laughs> <laughs> I tell people the summer's off, and I'm like, that's not true. Um, yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out. I think I just kind of got into it. Uh, working with Brown Issues and working with you, um, it just seemed like the next next kind of step, and I, I thought I, I, would, I would be all right with it. I thought I would have that. Um, so that's why. I'm still not sure. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, as for the next one, what's the most difficult thing about yeah. teaching? Woo! Just put out a list. <laughs> put out a list. Um, Let's start with systematic. Uh, when we talk about education and getting budget cuts and where those 
where those budgets are allocated, uh, you can see that it's it's not student first. You know, um, all of the unions, I love unions just on principle. Uh, the fact that you know, like the raises and the structure, and I'll go through the strike now. Yeah, I'm with it. But but at the end of the day, we got uh, old ass teachers in that are you know pushing 60, 70, 80, and they have a file cabinet, and they walk over that file cabinet and they pull out a sheet that's being photocopied about 600 times, and then they pass it off to the students and they call it a day. And we're not going to get rid of them. They get paid more than me. They don't put 10 percent of the effort into the classroom as I do. Uh, and they're going to retire with much more money than all of our students as a systematic part. Um, another one is we can talk about uh, just just the, the funding for our schools and how disproportionate it is for students of color. We can talk about mismanagement of money. If you ever go to the school board meetings, you can see them using uh, Title I funding that should be given to uh, low income students and spent on things that at the end of the day would benefit students that are already coming from. Uh, we could talk about uh, policing in schools, and we could talk about SROs. And we could also discuss uh, how teachers don't necessarily know how to deal with students, and so the best thing for them to do to make their job easier is pick up the phone and say, I need a security guard in this classroom to pick up this kid. You know, so that's the systematic part I see the difficulties of teaching. Uh, when it comes to teaching within the classroom, that's when it gets uh, new ones. And there's not a really a cure all. There's no, there's no, no one thing that I would say this will make our teaching much better. Um, but being into a classroom, I think a difficulty I've had in teaching uh, history, in teaching math, in teaching English, in teaching geography, and all these courses that I have taught before, is the difference in the levels of the students and me being expected to be able to reach all of them. So what I mean by that is I come in and when I Algebra, for example, and I'm trying to teach an Algebra 1 class and recognizing that a student has a fourth grade reading level and their math skills are even less and I'm expected to have them pass the test by the end of the year, right? So getting up on the board and saying who knows how to add and uh, divide, who knows how to do multiplication, and having students say, oh, I know how to do it, but not necessarily knowing how to do it, you know, because of course it's hard. So one technique I did do, just to throw it out there, you're going to become a teacher and you can for teaching math. I knew that they'd probably get the best of them. And so one thing that I asked, I said, who feels like they understand this? Give me a thumb up. And the students that knew what they were doing, they were doing it. said, whoever feels um, like they're not, they're kind of getting it, but not all the way, but with a little bit more practice, give me a shake of hand. Give me a shake of hand. The students put up shake hands. And whoever just is lost, give me a thumbs down. No one damn well, no one's going to put a thumb down. The students that are lost are going to give me a shake hand, but I let them take the prior, and now let me know who I need to work with. Okay. Uh, being able to work with students that don't have the right reading levels, and I look at their stuff, and I say, holy shit, now I understand why you mess up in class. Now I understand why you're such a behavior problem, because you can't read or write at the level you're supposed to. I see that um, across California when I'm working in Riverside, and sat there with a student trying to do a, a summer application to a program. Um, with the Chicago student program at my university, and him being 16 and saying, No, nah, could you do this for me? Because I realized that he just couldn't read as a 16 year old. Um, I realized that when I was teaching at Rosa Parks, and the same kids that were messing up, I read their stuff and I said, You cannot spell and save your life. Um, even now, students with aspirations, and it fucking kills me when they come up and say they have aspirations to go to college, and I look at their reading and writing, and I say, There is no chance of you to be able to get into the college that you're talking about. And even if you did, I'm sure that you would drop out because of this. Yeah, um, so I, it really started when I was at my undergraduate degree. And uh, you know some of the some of the bills were coming up, and I'm like, how do I get involved? Uh, you know, this is about that transformative uh, component. And I ran into people like, and some of you may already know him, Daniel Dart. Ran into Daniel Dart. Uh, uh, he's actually friends with Shepard Ferry, the guy who painted that uh, mural. Um, and then uh, some other people who are organizing. Uh, you know, on our campus, and so 
we, we just went ahead and uh, just talked about like what did you get involved, uh, what did we get involved, and really just kind of uh, put together. Um, I don't know everybody's name, but I just you know I was hanging out with them that day, and um, we had people donate T-shirts, pizzas, and so we fed the campus and clothed them and just um, had an open mic for. Um, you know, and have like an open mic for spoken word poetry and some other things that people were just able to say the things that were on their minds, especially on like Prop 57 and what it would mean for our, our folks to build a certain time. Um, from that point, it really, uh, I really saw like value in it um, and really wanted to continue on with it. And so I started going to the uh, anti racism coalition uh, policy training in Los Angeles and started doing that there. Um, and came across Kila, who is a uh, Esteban supervisor, um, and um, you know he, he's very, very demanding. And so he just really, uh, by him being so demanding, what it did is really um, put a level of professional development component built into this training. And I didn't realize that until after afterwards. I'm like, I'm well versed in this, and it's because. He his and I know that someone will tell you like he his expectations are up to here. He will always and it doesn't matter if you improve like you improve and then like no no it's actually right here. And so he, he will always like ask you to do better. Um, and I think and then I realized like this whole people that are still incarcerated, but it, there's a professional development component that so many people who are fully fully incarcerated miss. Because we're we're stuck in a cell doing time with other people doing time, and we're not in meetings with you know CEOs, CFOs, um, or GMs or whoever it is. We're not in those meetings, and so we miss out on that huge portion of the, that professional development. And so that uh, policy has really um, uh, how you tell a story. It's really structured, uh, and, and it, it, they're structurally a professional development component. And so that's why I encourage uh, private rebound students, uh, only incarcerated people, to um, go out and, and get involved in policy because you can have start having control of your own body, uh, advocate for people who can't advocate for themselves, and you can start developing yourself. Because we all can need jobs later on. And if you have, if you have, the ability to the talk. You can probably, there's a good chance, if you're in an interview, there's a good chance you can land that job if you can really tell them what they want. If they really see what they want to see uh, in that position, whether you're fully incarcerated or not. So we need all the tools at our disposal to be able to have that vertical mobility. So that's why policy is important, in my opinion. And as a law clerk in the federal system, I saw the benefit of some of the federal equipment of these bills, and it opened doors. There were guys getting sentence reductions up the right and we reduced the drug quantity tables, did a bunch of Prop 47 appeals, and things that eliminated predicates that were used to enhance their sentences. And it, it, I mean, it was amazing to see. There's like a political will for these, I mean, just to make it to the governor's desk that all these bills are actually making it there through assemblies. It was really a huge step. Wow, yeah, yeah, and we thank you for it. Um, all right, Manny.